Hey guys, today we are going to be discussing the essay Can Computers Think by John Searle. And this is a cool essay um, in part because the topic uh, is an interesting one to think about. I think it's kind of at play in a lot of the science fiction stuff we watch and maybe we even think about this a lot. Uh, but also because from the standpoint of our course, it in, in some sense is the culmination of a lot of the different things we've been talking about, right? Like the mind-body problem, uh, issues of self and consciousness, and these questions about functionalism and all that good stuff. So I think you'll see all that come to play for today. And Searle was writing this kind of in response to a lot of stuff that was happening in the years following up when the idea of artificial intelligence was really becoming like a hot topic, uh, and scientists and philosophers started having a lot to say on this topic. So. The structure of Searle's essay is pretty interesting. Um, he lays out what the dominant view in philosophy of mind is with regard to this question. Um, and he lays it out well, right? He, he thoroughly explains the objection clearly. He doesn't straw man it. He lets it breathe, so to speak. And then once he lays out uh, claims and arguments from this position, then he gives you his refutation of the position. So it's pretty clear, straightforward thing. So. If you look on that first page, Searle starts out by saying, the prevailing view in philosophy, psychology, and artificial intelligence is one which emphasizes the analogies between the functioning of a human brain and the functioning of digital computers. Right, so the idea is that whatever your brain is, it's the same thing as a digital computer, right? What your brain does is the same thing, therefore it is the same thing, right? There's this functional overlap. Uh, to continue, according to the most extreme version of this view, the brain is just a digital computer and the mind is just a computer program. One could summarize this view, I would call it strong artificial intelligence or strong AI, by saying that the mind is to the brain as the program is to the computer hardware. So. That's an important term, because if you're going to do further research on this stuff, you'll come across this. So Searle is going to explain this thing called strong AI. So strong AI is a position within philosophy of mind that seeks to understand the relationship between the mind and the brain and the nature of the mind and the brain uh, by analogy to a computer. So the idea with proponents of strong AI is that the mind is to the brain as software is to hardware, right? So the hardware of your computer, that's the actual uh, physical stuff, right? The, the keyboard, uh, the hard disk drive or the solid state drive, whatever it is, the motherboard, anything in there. And then the software is these are the programs that run in the hardware. And so if you're a proponent of strong AI, you think the mind and the brain, exactly like that. It's just some kind of advanced computer, advanced in some sense, not advanced in another sense. So Searle continues to explain this position by saying, on this view, any physical system, whatever, that had the right program with the right inputs and outputs would have a mind in exactly the same sense that you and I have minds. Uh, it must have thoughts and feelings because that is all there is to having thoughts and feelings, implementation of the right program. So we're here, you know, having these conversations about consciousness all semester, and people that believe in strong AI think, you know, it's kind of only a matter of time uh, until genuine thought is happening in the machine, right? Consciousness is happening uh, in the machine because for these people, it's just a matter of creating the right inputs and outputs creating the right system and the right way that the system functions. And that's it, right? That's what a mind is. So you might be wondering if Searle is being charitable uh, with this position, right? Like, do people actually think that the brain is just like a computer and the mind is just like a program running on the computer? And the answer is yeah. And I think when we go through some of the examples he gives, what you'll see is that that way of saying it is actually the softer way of saying it, because there are people that are making claims that are 
for him, a lot more extreme. Maybe you agree with these, maybe you don't. Uh, but the idea is to go through them so then we can go over Sar uh, Searle's argument against them. So if you look on the, the following page, it says uh, 670, he, he goes over some specific people. He says, Herbert Simon of Carnegie Mellon University says that we already have machines that can literally think. There is no question of waiting for some future machine because existing digital computers already have thoughts in exactly the same sense that you and I do. Okay, so for some people, it's not a, a matter of if or a matter of when. It's a matter of, no, we already do have computers that think. Uh, Simon's colleague, Alan Newell, claims that we have now discovered, and Searle says, notice how he says discovered, uh, as opposed to hypothesized or considered a possibility. But we have discovered that intelligence is just a matter of physical system manip or symbol uh, manipulation. Any system, whatever, that is capable of manipulating physical symbols in the right way is capable of intelligence in the same literal sense as the human intelligence of human beings. So for these kinds of people, the idea is that intelligence, which is a related concept, is nothing other than being able to manipulate symbols in the right ways. And if that's the case, if intelligence is nothing other than that, and intelligence is indicative of a mind, and if computers indeed just manipulate symbols, which they do, then that would have to mean that computers and other machines are intelligent, and in fact maybe even have the mind. And Searle kind of goes on this story to say, um, you know, someone who's closely related with being like the father of uh, artificial intelligence says, even machines as simple as thermostats can be said to have beliefs. And indeed, according to him, almost any machine capable of problem solving can be said to have beliefs. Okay, so we're not even talking about computer computers, like the thing you're on, right? Or even complex machines. We're talking about even basic machines, like a thermostat, right? Something that measures uh, temperature. It has the beliefs of, it's too hot, turn temperature down. It's too cold, turn temperature up. It's just right. Don't mess with temperature at all, right? So this is the strongest strong eye, right? People who say these kinds of things. And Searle doesn't think this is right, right? So the claim in a vague sense would be strong AI is incorrect. Um, the mind and the brain, the relation, what they are and the relation they have to one another is not merely the same thing as a computer and its program. There's more involved. So the goal now is to kind of look for why that's the case. And by the way, Searle wants us to back up a moment and say, when we're looking at his argument, what we don't want to do is incorrectly assume that he's saying the current state of computation isn't enough to constitute a mind, but that one day technology will advance so drastically that it will be capable of doing that. No, he's not making a contingent claim. He's not saying strong AI, AI is incorrect right now. Rather, he's saying it's incorrect in principle, in essence, by definition, meaning regardless of any kind of technological advancement, uh, there's some kind of conceptual problem that just can't be solved, right? It's like a metaphysical impossibility, in other words, um, that we can understand the mind in the way that the strong AI proponents claim to understand the mind, right? So it's not a matter of scale, right, or time in terms of technology. Again, it's a matter of the type of thing that the mind is. It's just not the same type of thing that what a computer is doing, no matter how you spin it or how advanced the computer is. So before he does this, doing good philosophy, he says we have to first explain what a digital computer is. Because I can't really make the claim that thinking is not merely the same as digital computing um, without first having a solid definition of what digital computing is. Uh, and not only that, we can't effectively understand his opponent's arguments unless we know just what digital computing is, uh, is rather. And so he gives us a pretty good definition in that second column on 670. He says, um, 
It is essential to our conception of a digital computer that its operations can be specified purely formally. That is, we specify the steps in the operation of the computer in terms of abstract symbols, sequences of zeros and ones printed on a tape, for example. So that's what digital computing is. You all have heard of binary code. And at root, this is what a computer does, right? A computer is, there's literally just a system of zeros and ones passing through, going into it, and then it spits out some other symbols of zeros and ones, right? So at heart, a computer is a symbol manipulator, and it does the things it does um, by manipulating symbols, right? And he says these symbols are purely formal. They're purely abstract. And that notion of abstractness uh, and formalness is going to be the key to why he thinks computing is not the same thing as thinking. He says, the symbols have no meaning. They have no semantic content. They are not about anything. They have to be specified purely in terms of their formal or syntactical structure. The zeros and ones, for example, are just numerals. They don't even stand for numbers. And so this is an interesting distinction because what Searle is saying is he's invoking this distinction between form and content, right? And when you say that the, com the computer's operations are purely formal, what you're saying is it's just playing with a set of symbols without any regard for what the symbols mean. So when a computer executes a task, it doesn't understand the task, right? This is his point. It doesn't... Um, have a mental representation, in some sense, we could say, um, of the task, right? It, the symbols don't mean anything to the computer. It's just like this detached mechanism thing happening. Um, and he says, and it's funny because we talk about zeros and ones as numbers, but that's even saying too much because it's not like the computer is understanding of what the concept of zero means and what the concept of one means. And it's like using the meaning of these numbers to do something. No, no, they're just numerals, right? They're like detached symbolic forms of numbers. Like it's even a step removed from that. And this is why he says it's syntactical, right? As opposed to what he's going to describe as semantical. So to continue reading, uh, but this feature of programs that they are defined purely formally or syntactically is fatal to the view that mental processes and program processes are identical, right? So this is why strong AI fails. And the reason can be stated quite simply. There is more to having a mind than having formal or syntactical processes. Our internal mental states, by definition, have certain sorts of contents. If I'm thinking about Kansas City, or wishing that I had a cold beer to drink, or wondering if there will be a fall in interest rates, in each case, my mental state has a certain mental content in addition to whatever formal feature it might have. Um, that is, even if my thoughts occur to me in strings of symbols, there must be more to the thought than the abstract strings because the strings by themselves can't have any meaning. If my thoughts are to be about anything, and that's the key, then the strings must have a meaning which makes the thoughts about those things. In a word, the mind has more than syntax, it has semantics. And the reason that no computer program can ever be a mind is simply that a computer program is only syntactical and minds are more than uh, syntactical, they are semantical, right? So the way Searle goes about arguing against strong AI is to invoke this principle uh, in psychology and philosophy of mind, which is called intentionality. Now, clear from your head any previous notion of intention, because usually when you think of the word intention, you mean like, oh, did you mean to do something? Was that what you wanted to do? Did you intend to go to the store or did you just do it because you were forced to, right? 
That's not what this means. That's not what intention means here. So intentionality um, within philosophy is this idea that we could say something like that consciousness is always of something. Right? Or similarly, you can say mental states are about something. There's meaning involved, right? Like, there's not blank consciousness that's consciousness of nothing. There's not blank mental state that's about nothing, right? And this is why the mind, why consciousness ultimately winds up being different than a computer, because for the mind, there's this act of consciousness uh, that's, that's pointed at something that has a meaning, whereas for the computer, there's not, like, anything uh, semantic or meaning-based that's pointed at by the formal operational processes of the computer. That's the big, there's no inside of the computer's mind, so to speak. But I don't want to take that too far because that might make Searle sound like a, a kind of dualist and he really isn't. Um, but that's also an interesting point, right? Is to see how what Searle's saying can in, somehow, can in some way relate to some types of dualism but then in other ways not, right? This is why a lot of this stuff is nuanced. It's not just black and white. It's like, hmm, at some point we have to split hairs between positions because sometimes positions look like other positions because they're both against the third position, but they're actually two different positions. But anyway, to illustrate his point, um, there's this famous thought experiment that Searle comes up with that's usually referred to as the Chinese room thought experiment. And the Chinese room is intended to show the difference between uh, thinking, between the mind, between consciousness, between uh, semantic stuff, and between, uh, I'm sorry, between that and what a computer does, right? There's a difference between when a human understands something, and there's a difference between when a computer operates as if it understood something, right? So the Chinese room experiment goes something like this. He says, all right, imagine you have a computer and the computer is running this program that is really, really sophisticated in language and it can speak Chinese, right? For all intents and purposes. Um, meaning you can give whatever inputs in Chinese to the computer and it'll give you the correct outputs in Chinese as well as a, a a native Chinese speaker would, right? The question is, does the computer really speak Chinese? Does the computer really understand the language? That's the question. He says, all right, so to attack the question, I'm going to give you a similar situation. Forget about the computer for a moment. Imagine that you are in a room. You're in this room, and through a little slit in the door, you get these pieces of paper that have what appear to you as squiggles on them, right? Because it's a language you don't understand. It's in Chinese. And what you have to do is output certain symbols back through the slit in the door to a native Chinese speaker, right? And so the idea is that you will do this, but the way you'll go about doing it is looking at an instruction manual. And the instruction manu uh, manual is very basic. It'll say if certain squiggle, then output certain squiggle symbol, right? So all you do is you get the thing in the door. You say, all right, it has this symbol. Let me look in the booklet. Ah, okay. It says if this symbol comes in, I put out this other symbol. And you feed it out to the door. Now, the person on the outside of the room is a native Chinese speaker. So to them, it appears as if the person in the room speaks fluent Chinese, right? But you don't actually understand a word of Chinese like Cyril keeps saying. And so in that situation, would you say the person in the room understands the language? You'd probably say no, right? They're just manipulating uh, symbols, giving outputs based on inputs and an instruction manual, right? You say that's not the same thing as speaking a language. Cyril says, Bingo. But that's exactly what a computer is doing. 
Therefore, the computer does not speak a language. The computer does not understand. It's not just about language. The computer doesn't understand anything when it's operating. It's just manipulating a series of symbols in, according, uh, in accordance with a set of instructions relative to inputs and outputs. That's it. That's it. Therefore, the computer uh, doesn't have a mental state. Right? It's not about anything in the same way that the person in the Chinese room's function is not about the language of Chinese. Right? It's not about semantic stuff. It's not about meaning. So that's supposed to prove Searle's point here. Um, and by the way, what you can recognize here and what he goes into is this winds up putting Searle uh, at odds with like functionalism or behaviorism. And we talked about behaviorism earlier in another video when we did uh, B.F. Skinner's Science and Human Behavior. And recall that behaviorism said, you know, all there is to an organism or a system is its function, right? And Sir, uh, Searle is clearly disagreeing because he's saying, well, if that was the case, then we would say that the computer has mental states and the computer thinks. If the only thing there is uh, is functional identicality. But he's saying, clearly not. Right, so something like behaviorism in the way that Skinner formulated it or functionalism in some broad sense can't work. There's more to it than formal functions. There's an aboutness. There's a semantic structure. There's intentionality that's missing. So if you want to figure out, all right, but how can we put Searle's argument in standard form to understand it clearly? We can do that. We can do that based on what he said. And you get all this information from the pages leading up to this. Um, and then at the top of 72, I think it's worked out pretty nicely. So you could say the first premise in Searle's argument uh, is this idea that basically syntax alone is not sufficient for semantics. Right? Whatever semantics is, it's extra than syntax. It's something that's not already contained in the concept that is syntax. So that's the first premise. Okay. That's the first premise, right? Syntax alone is not sufficient from semantics. There's something extra in semantics that isn't already contained within the concept of syntax. Okay, fairly straightforward. Second premise, uh, thought is necessarily semantic. Ignore my sloppy writing. And, and when we say that thought is necessarily semantic, we don't mean to say semantic, semanticality is sufficient for thought or that some, the semantic component is the only component of thought. That would be a separate claim. The claim is rather that semanticality is a necessary part of thought. Thought can't exist without it. Right? In the same way that like a bachelor couldn't exist without the quality of unmarried or without the quality of male, right? Or that like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich couldn't exist without peanut butter. That's not to say that a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is only peanut butter. It just means that a PB and J sandwich can exist without peanut butter, right? So you see the distinction. Um, the third premise you see, Charles, uh, Charles Searle says something like, digital computers by definition only have syntax. Right? Digital computers have syntax. And again, it's by definition. It's not like right now computers only have syntax and don't have semantics, but like someday they will. No, the, the concept is limited to this, right? It is essentially syntactical, right? There's no way around it. And so you can conclude Right? Therefore, simply, 
computers cannot think. Right? We have this pretty valid deduction happening here, this nice logical structure. So syntax alone is not sufficient for semantics. Thought is necessarily semantic. Computers, by definition, only have syntax, right? which means they can't have semantics, which means, therefore, computers cannot think. This is why the Chinese room example is very compelling, because it demonstrates very clearly uh, that the functional operation of a computer is, is not semantical, right? There's no meaning. And he says another way you could think about this is to think about whatever native language you speak. So let's say English, for example, that's what I speak. So he says, imagine having a conversation with someone in English, and then imagine having a conversation with someone in a language you don't understand. So Chinese would work for me. Now imagine the first instance we're just talking. But in the second instance, every time you say something, I just have to like look in a book and then be like, okay, I'm supposed to make this sound. There is a difference between those two scenarios, right? In the first one, I'm speaking English, right? There are mental states that are about something. I'm not merely engaging in symbol manipulation, whereas in the, the, the latter scenario, I am just engaging in symbol manipulation, and that's not the same thing as thinking understanding, speaking a language. For this reason, the answer to Searle's original question, uh, can computers think, is no, broadly speaking. And he goes through all this work um, to explain what he means by that question. And he says the question properly form, uh, formulated is, is instantiating or implementing the right computer program with the right inputs and outputs sufficient for or constitutive of thinking? No, that's what he means. So that is basically it. We saw the arguments for strong AI, and we saw Searle's argument against strong AI, uh, and in standard form, right? We saw his, his thought experiments that are intended to demonstrate his argument more clearly. So we can stop there for today. As always, if you guys have any questions on this stuff, feel free to email me. Um, Feel free to sign up for office hours and all that good stuff. I'm always here to help, and I'll see you around. Have a good day.